All right. So here again is a, is a simple illustration, right? So you have a group of, of the population that's susceptible. And then a part of them becomes infected. And of those that are infected, some are symptomatic, and we identify those as cases because they have symptoms and they've come to a healthcare expert for evaluation. Um, while some of those that are infected remain asymptomatic and are unknown. Those cases, um, for the majority of them, are particularly with COVID-19, are gonna be sent home. And they're gonna convalesce at home. Um, and some of those that are convalescing at home are gonna worsen and be hospitalized. And some of those that present as cases initially um, will be hospitalized because they have greater medical need. Following this process of either being at home or hospitalized, again, the majority of those are gonna become, are gonna be recovered. Um, and yet a minority are gonna die. And a case fatality rate is defined as the deaths per cases, right? And so this is something that has been really interesting to see occur in the lay press where um, there's been this rush to try to include a bunch of asymptomatic um, patients in the denominator and say that the case fatality rate isn't as severe as was suggested in other, in other studies and other locales. And it's not, an, it's, not, it's not unexpected that case fatality rates would differ between populations. Um, just like it's not, it's not unexpected that case fatality rates may differ between public hospitals and private hospitals or in hospitals in affluent areas versus hospitals in more, more urban areas. Um, or with less affluent areas. Um, in either case, case fatality rates are, are not expected to be homogeneous across the entire world. And so we do expect there to be some variability to them. Um, but there's also some certain things that you expect from case fatality rates when you're looking at disease processes that are similar. And so, um, you know, looking at a disease like influenza, even during a bad year of influenza, um, there are there's a certain case fatality rate that's associated with that. And, and we've known this whole time that this virus was gonna have a higher case fatality rate than that for many obvious reasons. Um, first and foremost being that there is no opportunity for any herd immunity to, to occur at the get-go, right? Um, secondly, that we didn't have any immediate treatment available. And, and, and thirdly, that the rate of disease could exceed health course, health core, sorry, healthcare resource um, allocation. And, and so therefore, those, any, any disease that can do that can increase its case fatality in comparison to other diseases that are expected when there's a seasonal effect occurring and you kind of ramp up your staffing for that season and so on and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, the important part here is just to, just to recognize this, that this is the way that you die, this is the way you calculate a case fatality rate. And you can't dilute it with a bunch of asymptomatic patients. Now, the importance of this will be made evident in just a moment. But when you look at the number of deaths per those that are infected, that's called the infection fatality rate, right? And that's what, um, what we're seeing being mislabeled as a case fatality rate in the lay press. They're just not... They're, haven't been connecting the two correctly and understanding that the case fatality rate is different than the infection fatality rate, right? And infection fatality rates are expected to be lower than case fatality rates because it includes asymptomatic patients. And so these are used for different reasons and I'll, I'll explain this in a moment. So if you're a doctor or, or um, PA and, and a patient comes to you to the hospital with symptoms and they ask you, you know, what's the chance that I'm going to die from, from this infection? Um, well, do you quote them the infection fatality rate? Or do you quote them the case fatality rate, right? And the, and the, the proper, in my opinion, the proper answer is that you quote the case fatality rate because that's what we know of patients that are presented with symptoms that have required, especially those that required hospitalization and so on and so forth, that there's a certain fatality rate associated with that and and that's their risk of mortality and we wouldn't dilute their risk um, by explaining that them that their risk is the infection fatality rate on the other hand um, if you are 
in charge of planning health resources across the country, the infection fatality rate is an important aspect to know of how many, what, what your burden is gonna be, uh, particularly on services that service the dead. And that infection fatality rate is an important predictor of where you need to allocate resources uh, for that. Because again, we expect these rates to differ um, across different geographies and across different socioeconomic bounds and, and across different, you know, even different countries with, within all of that. And so the infection fatality rate is an important uh, metric as well, but it's used for a different purpose. And it's not, it, it's, it's not to um, diminish um, the worries or concerns of those cases that we see. Are there any, any questions about the differences here between, between, these, uh, between these rates? No, but thank you for bringing that up because I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't quite think about that. Yeah, and it's a hard, you know, and, it, and it's a hard thing because you're looking at the, you're looking at the press and you're seeing the numbers change all the time and it's, it's really difficult to try to figure out like, well, what do I say to a patient and how do I counsel them and their family? with regards to what's going on. And, and you kind of really have to have these strong delineations in mind of like um, why we created these definitions and these rules and what their, what their benefit is to information. So 